Hello and welcome to the second World 101X live stream event. We are joined here today with University of Queensland <coughs> academics who have been featured in this course. And today, my name is Carrie Finn and I'll be moderating the panel for, for this exciting session, right? Yes. It will be. Very exciting session. And you can submit any questions that you have to the YouTube channel that is streaming this event. You can also go into the course on edX and submit any questions to the discussion forum. Um, before we get started answering the questions that we've had submitted from our students, just want to briefly introduce each of our panelists today. We're starting uh, with Sally Babbage, and Sally was featured in episode seven of the course in Chile in the Atacama Desert. And then we have Gerhard Hofstetter, who is featured in, well, throughout the entire course, but his primary research area was in episode eight, which was focusing on refugees in Malaysia. And then we also have Kim DeRight. Kim is featured in episode nine, which was focusing on the coal seam gas fields in Australia. And so we are going to start with some questions that actually go back to the very beginning of the course. And the first section of World 101X focused on indigeneity, its definition and its construct. And on the discussion forums, our students continue to find this topic extremely challenging. For example, a student writes, we've used the terms indigenous people or dominant culture, but neither term seems correct. Is there a term to describe the settled population of a country or area that is somewhat culturally homogenous, but not necessarily racially homogenous. How would you guys help our students further their understanding of indigeneity as it relates to colonialism, maybe to politics, or even just to your own research and field work? Does anybody want to volunteer to start? Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, I guess start by saying any term, as an anthropologist, you start off by Thinking, well, any term is never going to satisfy all of the complex kind of social and cultural criteria that make up the way people identify. So, you know, um, so I'm not surprised that they're not satisfied. <laughs> um, but the other, but the point is that um, the, the term or, or, the, or the category indigenous peoples is, is an important social category in the world, an important political category. Um, in many places, but especially um, in settler colonial societies where indigenous peoples are both politically and demographically significant. Um, uh, it's, it's an important category to think about um, in terms of those settler colonial societies, in terms of a category of people who were, um, who uh, continue to be and who were oppressed by the process of colonization. So that relational, um, uh, so that relation between the colonized and the colonizer is important in terms of that category of indigenous people. And then it's increasingly becoming this really important political category in other parts of the world, which are not necessarily um, settler colonial societies. So throughout Africa, where the idea of indigenous peoples um, as defined in the UN Charter, or, de or rather the Declaration um, of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, where, where people are taking on, and other instruments as well, right? So, you know, there are, other, there are other international instruments where this definition comes to play. But people are taking up this as, as uh, at the idea of the identity, the indigeneity, Indigenous Peoples, as having political force. So being identified as Indigenous Peoples, you have political force in negotiations against transnational corporations, some people against their own governments, um, and so on. So in places like Africa, for example, on the African continent, various people are taking this up in ways that I, I guess, you know, a number of years ago wasn't foreseen. And so it's a really important category for anthropologists to understand. But it's not one, it's not one thing, it's many different things. So actually I'm not surprised that people are confused. But it, that's what makes it such an interesting thing to look at, well, for me, at least, the comparative way in which people have taken up this category in ways that weren't foreseen when the category was, I guess, 
brought into the world um, through through processes like um, like the UN Declaration, brought into the world more prominently um, by that process, mm. and, and turn into a legal instrument, right? and turn into a legal instrument. Yeah, sure. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, look, I'm fully in agreement uh, <laughs> with Sally on this one. Um, I guess in the previous episode about coal and gas, I didn't much talk about my other topic, which had to do with this big dam uh, conflict, right? And I just thought maybe it's, it's helpful to, to refer to that, where I worked with, if you like, settler descent, right? Mm. Uh, so white Australians, largely. Mm. And I guess that's been a theme also in Richard Martin's and David Trigger's work uh, that I also employed in my work in that conflict where it is, I think, revealing to look at how a broader category of persons start to relate to land, right? And so we have indigenous people as a category um, with particular political standing, as, as Sally pointed out, mm -hmm. and some particular histories. But at the same time, we have, if you like, settler descendants, right? People who've lived here for a number of generations having particular ties to this land. and. I'm interested in seeing the relationship or examining the relationship, the tension really, between those forms of belonging in a, in a relatively new country and what you, what you might call first peoples, um, right? And, and the kind of political contest uh, between these categories of people, uh, but also to look at how, how do people understand their own sense of place in, in a country like Australia? Right, where um, there is no doubt that uh, many settler descendants also feel a strong sense of place and so on, which is different to indigenous relations to land, but also yeah, often in some way inspired by it, in, if you like. So many, many people in that dam conflict would speak about uh, the kind of ideal form of belonging being that of indigenous people, right? the kind of strongest forms of attachment that mm. you might have uh, and then compare their own sense of belonging in that way mm. uh, to indigenous people and so on, right? Saying it is different but related and so on. So I think that's that kind of what Richard and David have spoken about in, in terms of that intercultural domain that is particularly interesting in the post-colonial mm. setting. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, which also plays out in resource conflicts and, and, and other um, contentious issues in, mm. in, in these mm -hmm. societies. Yeah. Can I just jump back in there just mm. really briefly? I think mm. the key in terms of the definition then is, is this uh, is sense of place. Mm. And then for indigeneity, mm. it's firstness. Mm. Mm. <laughs> it's firstness in sense of place. Exactly, yeah. Um, and, then, and then how that, I yeah. guess, gets played out. That's it? right, yeah, mm. yeah. So the temporal aspect. Uh, oh, on the other hand, it can sometimes, I guess, um, end up, I think we, we talked about this previously, Gerhard, um, in another setting, where it can become this awkward numbers game, right? Where it's some, some you, you see this playing out sometimes. Right? We have been here so long, five generations or versus two generations or a thousand generations, or, right? And it becomes this kind of number game which um, is in some way um, point, you know, leading us away from what I think really matters uh, mm. sometimes. But certainly the temporal mm. is, is, uh, is pertinent. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. 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 Can I, I'll also jump in? Mm. Because I think what you mentioned is this tension. I think both mm. of you mentioned the tension is mm. actually really fruitful in anthropology often. Mm. If there is a tension in meaning, if there is uh, a diversity in meaning, and one of our favorite kind of taglines in anthropology really is context is everything. And I think we've talked a lot about Australia and, and mm. actually in Africa, things mm. are different. Southeast Asia, things are different. South America, things are quite different. So indigeneity, you know, you always have to look at the context and the history, mm. the specificity of a given place mm. and how things have turned out there, what kind of settler colonialism, if, what kind of colonialism has happened there, how it played out. And, and that's why history is actually really important to anthropology always, mm. um, to look at the local and mm. the specificity of a particular case. And so for students who are, who are identifying tensions or, you know, say, oh, neither seems correct, 
that's part of anthropology. There is usually no right answer. It's usually more difficult than that. You know, it's more complex than that. And anthropology is part of working through those tensions and, and trying to get to the bottom of it in a local specific case study. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned tensions, and I, and I know that, Kim, you were starting to allude to tension as well. And I think that fits nicely with the next question, which is just the general observation that anthropologists oftentimes find themselves in the middle of some kind of controversial situation, whether it's a local or a regional or even an international uh, situation. And I think that all three of you in, in the field sites that you've been working in have been deep in, uh, maybe not in it, but definitely surrounded by controversy. And I'm wondering if you can just talk about what you think, does anthropology have a place in, in activism? And how does it, how does it respond to that controversy? Is it possible for anthropology to be objective or anthropologists to be objective? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's right. I, th I think we can't be objective. And I think there's actually, there's, there's also two answers to that question about activism and anthropology because there's an anthropology of activism, right? So anthropologists study activism and activists and social movements and so forth. And so the, the, the other question is, is there a role for activism within anthropology? Um, and I think in the, first two, in the first episode, we actually talked about public anthropology, engaged anthropology, activist anthropology, militant anthropology, uh, lots of different versions within anthropology of engaging um, the tensions, the controversies as active participants, as observers, as dispassionate observers, as passionate observers. And I think... It, certainly in my experience, it's often a variety of those positionalities. Mm -hmm. um, we might go in with certain preconceived ideas of how things are going to develop. Um, invariably, they are overturned in time, and we find ourselves having to deal with whatever the situation um, de demands. And so I, I like the engaged anthropology um, because it means we're engaged. It doesn't mean I have a particular position um, for or against something. Um, I'm not for or against refugees, but the people I work with, I, I want to help them. And I'm engaged in their struggle for recognition. Um, what, what that engagement looks like, that can change over time. It changes in particular circumstances. Um, but that's, I think that's, that's my take on... <laughs> I think quite often, um, you know, questions like this, they put activism and the objective on two ends of a scale as though, you know, activism were necessarily subjective and just somebody's opinion, you know, in those terms. And objective was down the other end of a spectrum. Whereas I think, you know, many of us actually uh, work in ways that could be understood as more objective empirical work for particular purposes, where it's mostly descriptive work or um, direct, kind of, uh, I guess, less politically involved work, as well as work in ways that are more engaged or more active, even if it's not necessarily activism. Um, and that's part of, um, uh, perhaps I should explain a little what I mean. I guess you can work in ways that rely on uh, an, uh, an understanding of, um, of the empirical um, basis of your, of your ethnographic work and report on that in, in, a, in as impartial way as possible. Or you can work towards a political end with the same with the same work, you know, take that extra step. And I think a lot of us do both of those things for different purposes. For myself, um, I would do the more active end of that, the more activist end of that, and have done in the past where I've been asked to and where I believe it's the good thing to do. So I don't believe that necessarily it's the right thing for an anthropologist to dive in as an activist um, where they're not well informed of a situation and where um, their role as an anthropologist has not already kind of, I guess, been developed in a sense of knowing the lay of the land and, and getting a sense of what is the good or the right or 
um, <laughs> what the just of this situation mm -hmm. that would call for some kind of activism. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. Um, <laughs> I find myself in agreement uh, with most of what my colleagues say on this. Um, um, just in terms of my own work, I forget whether Gaud and I spoke about this in the previous episode, but for instance, with energy, you know, just coming back to my own work, um, mm -hmm. I take the approach that, um, well, and this is a personal preference perhaps, that I'd like to understand energy developments, contentious issues by studying up, down, and sideways, right? It's this kind of mantra, right? Um, that's contentious. Many people wouldn't agree with this position and say, no, no, you, you shouldn't uh, study corporations or uh, financial markets. Um, you should um, stick to the kind of work we did in the gas fields with marginalized people. Um, uh, and look, I have no problem with that position, frankly. Um, right? I think uh, the people that we visited in the gas fields um, uh, deserve to be given a voice properly. Right? And, and that's my personal position because they are vulnerable uh, they have been marginalized and they have not been taken into account in decision making properly, I think. Um, so certainly my aim is to, I guess, assist, help in that sense, um, these categories of people that, that have been, uh, that suffer, if you like, uh, the, um, the, the consequences of decisions that uh, impact them uh, without having been involved. Um, on the other hand, I, I guess, aim to understand the whole social field in a way, right? By also uh, trying to understand how do corporations make decisions about these kinds of things? Um, how do um, financial markets um, operate in such a way as to fund multi-billion dollar projects in a farming region in Queensland. I mean, how does that work? Um, knowing the answer to that, to some extent, I think is productive in trying to under understand energy around the world, you know, more holistically. And mm -hmm. yeah, so I guess again, you know, you move between what you might call an activist agenda or, or a, a kind of engaged f form and at other times, you might ask uh, questions that are more removed from that kind of agenda, if you like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do, do you think, sorry, do you think one, one of the issues is that activism is often equated with interventionism? Mm. That, mm. you know, when people talk about it, in, in this, the dichotomy that you mentioned, yeah. objective, you're just observing, mm -hmm. and then activism is where you're interjecting almost yeah. in, in, yeah, a, in yeah. a particular situation. Mm. Whereas Anyway and always, uh, doing ethnography mm. means being implicated. Mm. You're always implicated. In, and so th that's why all of us at the beginning said there is no objective because as an ethnographer, you're always implicated. You're always mm. connected to the world that you're studying. And so you are one of the objects. <laughs> you're one of the su subjects, rather, of the world that you're studying. And therefore, you're implicated. You're always there. You're always active in the world that you're studying. Mm -hmm. So um, then there are degrees and, 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 and contexts in which different things come mm. up. But yeah. mm. just, just to go along with that, Sally, we've actually had a couple questions from students who are watching. And the first one is, how does one design an ethnographic study? <laughs> and maybe if you wanted to talk about <laughs> that, you started to get in. You just mentioned that briefly. But how does one do that as an um, ethnologist? How would you de how does they design, one design I mean, it? people design an ethnographic study in many different ways. But I mean, I guess you start by becoming interested in a question, in, in an issue or a question or something out in the world that inspires you to understand more. And you start reading into it, you start exploring that. And then you start considering what's possible. Um, and then for me, the next step is to part of that exploring what's possible is to then go to the place where that thing is happening mm -hmm. and to ask people there whether it's 
something they're interested in engaging with you about. So seeking, seeking to know whether it's a useful thing in the world. I mean, sometimes when you're back in your office, in front of the computer, in the books, in the library, whatever, if you're reading about a, a, an issue that has become interesting to you, sometimes it's not clear whether it would be useful to follow through on that question. Sometimes you need to actually go out and explore. And then, I don't know, maybe somebody else can take it up from there. You know, the question, for me, a key question is, you have to be passionate about the thing that you're, you want to study, but the other thing is, is it useful? And sometimes you don't know if it's a useful question to pursue until you actually go and ask people about whether it's... Which is, is it feasible, the third thing? Isn't oh, the, it? oh, feasible. <laughs> yeah. There you go, there's the other one. Yeah, is it feasible? Mm. Um, yeah, mm. and, and those questions are... Those last two questions are both ethical questions about ethics, mm -hmm. yeah. Whether you, can, whether you can do the study well and mm. therefore whether it's worth doing, mm -hmm. yeah. You mentioned that you have to find something that's personal, that, that you personally find interesting. And so I know that you know, all three of you have, have researched drastically different topics in different parts of the world, actually. And I'm wondering if, if, if one or two of you would mind talking about that personal drive or what made you passionate about studying water rights in Chile, what made you passionate about studying, going to Malaysia and studying refugees, what made you passionate about, you know, the dam and about um, looking at the coal seam gas fields? Because they're just, I mean, maybe that's what anthropology is about. It's, a, it's about, it's not only about the people, but it's about this, this variety of, of experience and, and representation mm -hmm. of all these different, drastically different topics. Yeah. Know, can you can you maybe talk about what how you what what your where your personal passion came from to to look in these areas? It's it's not an easy question actually. <laughs> um, I guess um, I mean <laughs> you come to anthropology in a certain way with a particular background. You're inspired by you know, something, some questions, mm -hmm. some topics that you've read about, seen, heard about encountered in your life and you go look I, I really like to do anthropology and then of course within <laughs> the study of anthropology you you start reading broadly and right explore the different themes and perspectives from that in anthropology and then hopefully uh, something just you get a spark for something and mm -hmm. go this is something I'd really I'm really interested in and for me that was environmental anthropology mm. um, and uh, it's hard to say why that is so. Um, you know, I guess I have my own background f from Holland, um, working on farms as a young kid, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know, that has something to do with my interest in land. Mm -hmm. um, and slowly over the years that it has taken different forms, right? Um, working for Aboriginal organizations, uh, working in land rights, if you mm -hmm. like, native title claims and so on. And then, I mean, I, I write about this in my, my thesis as a preface to my thesis, how this happened um, with the dam where I was traveling around with my family just on a holiday and saw all these signs saying no dam, right? And um, was a kind of indication that farmers were expressing this sense of place to this valley. They didn't want to lose it. And I was still working for an Aboriginal organization. I thought, wow, this, what's going on here? Um, and it, it was that kind of spark, right? You go, mm -hmm. what, what is this all about? And you mm -hmm. kind of go, I want to know more about this. And, mm -hmm. and then it turned out there was a possibility to do a PhD project on it, and you, you take it, you grab it, and mm -hmm. you go for it, you know? And after finishing that, um, this, this fracking controversy was brewing, and I thought, oh, this is, this, I have to go for this, and um, <laughs> you know? But uh, something that hasn't been mentioned, and, and I think is important though, you, it also has to be practical. I mean, uh, so, you know, I have young kids, for example, and um, it's difficult for me sometimes to go away for three, four months from my family, right? So I have to also think about what, what, is, 
what can be done practically, right? Mm -hmm. And um, this was just ideal. So, you know, it's close to home, right? I can go backwards <laughs> and forwards. And, yeah. <laughs> Well, that was a, it's, yeah, it's yeah. a pertinent comment, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. logistics matter. Logistics <laughs> yeah. matter, absolutely. Yeah. 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 But, and yeah. they matter. Yeah. They matter ethically as well, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. in, to do the work well, mm -hmm. you have to be able to to get That's to where right. the work is being done. Um, if, if you can't, then then in some ways you fail ethically because mm. it's, you're not doing the work mm. as well as you possibly can. That's yet. right. You so don't spend the time yeah, there sufficiently yeah. and so on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. But that's also where you need the passion because mm. you want the investment that you're mm. putting in to be mm. real and not just mm. strategic or mm. you know to get a PhD or to mm. do something. Um, yeah, and in, in my case, <laughs> <laughs> please, <laughs> yes, uh, I've always been interested in the other, in otherness. And I actually started studying law and economics because mm. I wanted to be a diplomat. Um, and I gave it up really quickly because <laughs> I, I didn't see those subjects helping me in understand other people, other cultures. So mm. I, I switched to anthropology and international relations. And I, I, I left international relations and politics behind because the methodology didn't fit with actually trying to understand properly with that investment mm. and passion and logistics, actually, mm. of, of other people. And the thing that the, the, the primary question that's always been driving me is, how do people with different beliefs, different worldviews, different ideas about who they are and who other people are, live together peacefully? Mm. And that's how I got to Malaysia in the first place, because you had different ethnic groups, different religious groups, living in, in a kind of peaceful scenario that I came to understand through a long investment in time and effort <laughs> wasn't all that peaceful. There was a lot of structural violence, but it wasn't outward violence. But it takes a long time to understand what goes on behind the scenes. And, and the longer I stayed there, the more, and I started working on Islam and Islamic politics, the longer I stayed there, I, I, I was witnessing other groups of people who were marginalized, who, who, weren't, who weren't part of the power matrix that everyone was talking about domestically of Malay, Chinese, Indians in Malaysia. Uh, and that was migrant workers and refugees. And I, I, I focused on refugees because I thought they were the most marginalized of the marginalized uh, subset and, and have been working with them ever since. So I think the journeys, and, and as anthropolo in anthropology, it actually gives you a lot of you know, up, down, to the sideways. You, know, you might start with a particular project somewhere, and then the theme might take you elsewhere. Or the place that you've invested a lot in, you learn the language, you're living there, and then another theme might come up, mm. you know, mm. another mm. issue. Mm -hmm. And so you can move sideways or you, you move into other areas. And anthropology gives you that, that potentiality to actually do that. Mm. A lot of other disciplines are, are, are a bit more restrictive, in, in, uh, I find. In anthropology, you can always find something else and, and go for it. Mm. Mm. And I think that relates to a second question that we have. Um, from Bita Zhang, uh, Claire de Lune, which is, how do you distinguish anthropology from sociology? Which I think, um, I know at the university I went to, they were both in the, the School of Social Sciences. Um, I think they even shared an office. So mm -hmm. could you guys maybe explain to our students what that difference is or how you distinguish them? Well, they're I know you're going to be very pro-anthropology here. Well, <laughs> I mean, I would say, you know, there, it's a continuum, you know. Mm. I mean, if you have qualitative sociology, which is, a, is a, if, uh, if you like, a, a stream of sociology, a particular kind of sociology, you could argue that is in some ways very similar to anthropology um, in that it, it uh, includes field work, um, the qualitative aspect of life and what it means to be human and so on um, but you could on that continuum move further away to you know perhaps the furthest away the qualitative sociology which is very much about statistical relations and variables and so on um, uh, which is something perhaps anthropology is not so well known for mm. right um, but yeah I wouldn't I wouldn't you know kind of um, put it in, in, in a kind of par dichotomy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they, they are, of course, very much related. They, are, they both study the social world, uh, and they may employ methods that are very similar, uh, but at times 
also different, mm -hmm. um, but ideally uh, complement each other, um, uh, you know, in, yeah. in, in um, understanding what it means to be human, yeah. Mm. I have, an anthropo I have a PhD in anthropology and sociology, so I mean, it's, there you go. <laughs> it, it used to be, people used to say it's, it's, it's the methodology, but mm. as, you've, you know, mm. as you've just unpicked, it's not anymore. I think they have slightly different histories, intellectual mm. histories, where they come from. So sociology used to be that sociologists studied the West, predominantly industrialized mm. society, and anthropologists would go off to the exotic, faraway places. Um, that doesn't happen anymore either. So it's maybe only the intellectual histories that are divergent, but mm -hmm. they've come together now. Um, it's more within anthropology. You, you know, in the U.S., anthropology includes archaeology, biological, mm -hmm. physical anthropology, which is Linguistics, quite a yeah. quite a broad a broader anth definition of anthropology, even then in, in mm. the U.K. or in, in Australia. So those different trajectories and histories, also ethnology in Europe. Uh, folklore, folklorist studies, you know, those different histories have, have kind of merged these days where anthropology, sociology, mm. ethnology have come together and the diversity you see at this panel actually is, mm. is pretty broad already within, mm. but we could just as well be sociologists or in a sociology department mm. for that matter. Mm. Mm. Agreed. Mm. Uh, let's see, we'll continue on with one of the submitted questions and it's it's about episode seven, which is your episode, Sally, uh, where we, were, we asked students to respond to a poll question, an opinion map question that was asking if water is a right. And this question led, me, led to many discussions, <laughs> um, as well as a discussion of the meaning of the term right. What does it mean to have mm -hmm. rights or, or to, to possess them? and the role of the anthropologist in understanding the rights of people. So what are your thoughts or experience with the concept of rights and how mm. it relates to your field and your research? Yeah. Well, I hope that um, in your discussion, in, <laughs> in the, um, those enrolled in the, in the course, in their discussion, the discussion covered the idea that rights is, the idea of rights is a fairly recent idea. Um, that the liberal discourse of rights is, is a fairly recent idea. And um, it's a very useful idea, especially when you have situations of conflict, of, of contest over resources, for example. Um, so the, ex I mean, an, an example um, in, in the early 2000s in, in Bolivia, um, you know, the water wars in Bolivia where water was privatised to the extent that the most vulnerable, the, mo the, the poorest um, element, uh, people in society had the least access to water and, also, and were paying for water to drink, you know, were paying for because of privatisation, because of um, privatisation of water. And so these, you know, these, um, a kind of war erupted in Bolivia over water around the idea of rights around the idea of rights to water. So that really was about saying, you know, this was using the, the, the idea of rights to make a political, a very strong political statement. Um, rights um, is also really useful, a really useful way to talk about um, the, um, yeah, other, other forms of, of privatisation of an essential substance. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and especially where you have um, the kind of use of some uh, use of water to the extent that it does violence to other forms of life. So the the prevention of use of water by by humans and non-human life. But rights doesn't go. It, it's sort of beyond that situation of actual conflict. To me, the language of rights isn't enough. So there are all kinds of relations to water. Um, by, from humans and other forms of life, relations to water, that, that connect life and water, and, and water is life. You know, there are all these aspects of water that exceed, <laughs> that go beyond the notion of rights. Um, and that, you know, when we talk about water as spirit, when people talk about water as a being, when to people talk about water as an element of the earth when people, you know, this, they all, all of that goes actually beyond the idea of rights 
And so, you know, rights is important. It's an important way, in, in the same way that we were talking about social categories at the very beginning, about the idea of indigenous peoples, as this really important idea that can be put into play to deal with situations of social inequality, of, of violence and so on, that can be put into play to kind of help reckon with those situations. But, um, but when we're talking more broadly, when we're talking about what exists in the world, I think it's not enough to talk about rights. We need to think about, you know, what, what, what is this, this essential thing that, um, or being or, um, yeah, non-human relation, as some people would have it, some kind of cosmological being, you know. Um, so, yeah, what are, uh, rights aren't enough, but they're good. You know, <laughs> right, the idea of rights isn't enough, but it's a, but it's a useful and a, and and an interesting concept to think about um, in terms of what it potentiates and what it and what it limits mm -hmm. in terms of water. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Um, we'll we'll continue on to episode eight, which would have been which was your episode, Gerhard, on, on refugees, and a student wrote in um, and responded to an opinion map prompt. Uh, the student's name is Ramesh Krishnan, responded to an opinion map prompt with the following. The word, the word I associate with refugee is problem. The problem is how to handle it without causing distress in the host society. And as you might imagine, this generated lots of discussion on the forum. And a theme appeared in the form of the following question. How does a host country welcome refugees when there's so much fear about terrorism and unfair associations with refugees? And, and maybe how can anthropology help us understand this, this current, very, very current world issue? The first thing, again, is to look at the context and actually the history. Because like the issue of rights of indigenous people or water, you know, the refugee and the refugee definition is a post-Second World War creation. But refugees, of course, are much older than the legal, you know, enshrine, UN enshrined definition and, and, and debates that have come from that. Um, people have used different words for, for this sanctuary, providing sanctuary, providing shelter, safe place, safe haven. So there have been other ways of dealing with migration. And migration is as old as the human story itself. So people on the move is nothing new. And people being displaced by natural disasters, by fighting, by wars, etc., again, is, is a very old notion. Um, what is new is the rights discourse of what, uh, what we owe refugees and what we ought to provide for refugees as part of the international community of states. So I think it's related to the, the nation state and it's related to the sovereignty of the nation state and how it controls its borders or enshrines its borders as this is the inside, that's the outside. And if you are crossing this border, you know, who are you and how do we deal with you? So it becomes an issue of immigration and immigration control, certainly in Australia. That's the dominant discourse of the refugee, of, of anyone coming here, is how do we control this other who is transgressing the border? Um, because legally, the refugee convention that Australia is a signatory to um, demands that we provide sanctuary to refugees mm -hmm. for that period of time to verify their claims mm -hmm. and to say, yes, this is a refugee according to the convention definition um, or not. And if they are not, then they are to be returned to their country of origin. Um, if they are, we are to give them sanctuary. And instead we don't. And instead, the, well, the government here has found legal instruments. And this is where, you know, the, mm -hmm. we talk about rights and we talk about the UN conventions around things, but they're only as strong as national governments support them. In this country, the national government has found ways to circumvent. They're still a signatory, but they've circumvented the convention by excising the Australian mainland. So the whole of Australia doesn't exist anymore for our conventional uh, convention um, responsibilities. So it's as if Australia is off the map for the convention. <laughs> so we're still there, but we don't exist for refugees coming here. So they can't claim any rights that they're due according to the convention we've signed. So whilst there are these legal norms in international law and they're important, they're only as strong as national governments will support them. So in some countries that are not signatories, like Malaysia, 
Now, the protection space of Malaysia is not perfect. It's not great. It's not even adequate. Mm -hmm. But there are 150,000 registered refugees there and probably another 100,000 unregistered refugees who, by and large, find work, by and large, get by. And the Malaysian government kind of is looking the other way because they're allowing it to happen. And they have provided sanctuary to people over the years on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and they've always said, we don't want to sign the Refugee Convention because they see it as a Western legal instrument, and that's often a problem with mm -hmm. yeah. UN conventions and things coming out of New York and Geneva. Um, and they want to retain their sovereignty and to decide what to do with which refugees, who to take in, how long for, etc., mm -hmm. rather than sign up and then be subject to UN um, prescriptions. So I think we're, there's always, you know, this, this, this discourse of rights is really problematic mm -hmm. in, in that even countries that have signed up to all the conventions, they can get around them. Mm -hmm. So it's really about the ethos and how the ethos of those conventions are interpreted and enacted in national laws mm -hmm. that often, um, so it's the response of the national governments that's often much more important. In terms of integration, I think, and you know, distress in the host society, at the moment there's a lot of talk about refugee crises. Mm -hmm. But we've been living in, you know, in times of huge displacement for at least the last 20 years. Um, and, and really, there's been large-scale displacement all around the world for a very, very long time. It's about how we manage and how we deal with those challenges. And talking about a crisis always, always in, in, engenders responses that are often haphazard, um, that are often colored by fear, because a crisis, we need, we need to respond forcefully. And it often the responses are by re-erecting borders. And we've seen that in Europe. One of the great celebrations in, in my lifetime was the you know, unification of Germany and the opening up of the European Union and the breaking down of borders between Netherlands and Germany and France. And you could drive from Portugal to Sweden and never pass um, a passport check. What we witnessed is, as a response to the perceived crisis of large-scale people movement, the re-erection of border fences, mm. of immigration controls, and it's destroying the ethos and the, you know, the national ethos of interpreting EU legislation in this sense of, of open borders uh, within the EU. So sadly, you know, sadly, a lot of the, the hype around how we, how we think about large-scale mobility um, whether it's in Southeast Asia or in Europe or even in the U.S. along the U.S.-Mexican border and Central America, people's responses are sadly often colored by uh, the word crisis and the word many people are coming and what that may mean for me here. Mm -hmm. And it's often through othering processes of the other out there. And often people haven't met refugees. They don't know why people are fleeing, why people have, ha have been displaced sometimes by their own government's actions in other countries, right? And the issue of responsibility comes back. And I think so anthropology can help untangle this huge mess of who's coming, why, and how, and help untangle. <laughs> we can't all untangle. But help, help to make sense of some of those tensions of identities, tensions of who are these people, what do they want, what are they doing, why are they on the move? and problematize our own notion of who we are and our responses to these crises and, and better reflect upon our responsibilities, especially in richer countries such as Australia, to the global community out there, um, but also towards our governments and actually ask our governments very hard questions about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and why they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks. We've had another another question um, that is a, it's a bit off the topic of that, but somehow closely related because you're talking about how anthropologists can, um, how other people can learn from anthropology. And in this one, we're, the question is, what can the medical professions learn from anthropology? How can they improve um, their understanding? And, and the specific question is related to in coping with psychiatric patients or drug users. How can, how can anthropology influence those professions? It does already. Mm -hmm. Medical anthropology, an, an area of the sub-discipline, I guess, an area of the discipline that deals with um, 
with medicine and health, um, well-being in different societies uh, all around the world. Um, and think about, it, and going back to things we've said already about the way in which social categories are not absolute, but rather they, they shift. Um, and going back to also the idea um, that um, context is everything. And so if, I'm not a medical anthropologist, but just as a brief kind of sense of the way anthrop a medical anthropologist approaches these kinds of questions in terms of the idea of patient or drug user would always be thought about in terms of the broader context of that person's being, mm -hmm. cultural context of that person's life, as well as their other kinds of social practices apart from being a drug user, as well as their relations to others. Mm. Um, yeah, so anthropologists mm -hmm. often do that. They do that kind of thing where they say, well, okay, you've been this, you've defined this person as a patient or as a drug user, mm -hmm. But also, this person is a person in broader society. They have to be thought of in cultural context. And this person, you know, uses drugs, but they also, um, you know, do all of these other things mm -hmm. in life as well that make meaning. And so when you say learning for coping, then an anthropologist would help that process of saying, well, you know, how, what kinds of mechanisms are already in place for that person culturally or socially? Mm -hmm. That, that relate to that. Excellent. Mm. And a lot of, uh, maybe not a lot of, but there's lots of medical doctors who also mm. then study anthropology and, mm. and use that combined mm. knowledge. In Australia, Emma Cowell, who's mm. worked with um, mm. white um, doctors, doctors in, in Aboriginal Australia, um, mm. Paul Farmer in the US, Philip Bourgeois, uh, well, Paul Farmer's a medical doctor, mm. but Philip has, mm -hmm. uh, is, we have an interview with him yeah. who talks about drug use in the inner city in the US, mm -hmm. but Paul Farmer, who's a medical doctor, who used his expertise in medicine as well as anthropology to deliver um, better medical help mm. in crisis situations such as in Haiti and, and elsewhere. Um, so I think there's mm. lots of crossover and, yeah. So we do have another question, and I'm not sure I fully understand, but uh, we'll take a look at it. Uh, so the, the topic is the war, this is somewhat related, so the war on drugs is an issue around the world, such as in the Philippines, where they use violence rather than legal obligation. Um, I'm not sure if there's a question related to that and how anthropology can help us understand this. Um, is this something that any of you might have some knowledge about or even um, well, I think the I, idea of conflict, violence? Well, I think in, you know, it, it actually relates back to what we've been talking about, well, I was talking about a little bit, mm -hmm. in terms of the initial response of a lot of politicians to a perceived crisis is mm -hmm. through fear and often violence mm -hmm. or through fear and, the, you know, the stoking of of age-old divisions, for instance, in society, the scapegoating of, mm. of others. Mm. And it, 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 it strikes me that in the Philippines, the current president has used, you know, the war on drugs as a means to assert his power, to assert his, his position. Um, and I think anthrop there's some interesting anthropology mm. of the U.S. election happening at mm. the moment, where fear, again, is playing a big role. Mm. Um, and, and I think anthropology always brings to the table the context, contextualizing where certain ideas, concepts, ideologies are coming from and how they're being practiced on the ground, how, what the effect of those ideologies is. Um, and in this case, in the Philippines, I, I don't know anyone working on this particular issue at the moment, but it would be interesting and for sure there'll be anthropologists who will be picking through what is going on at the moment and the effects on the streets um, of, of, of extrajudicial killings that are going on at the moment in the Philippines, uh, what effects that has on society at large, mm. um, and especially on how drug users are seen. I mean, it relates back to the, the, fir mm -hmm. the first question just now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, looks like we, we're almost coming to the end. We've got about 10 minutes left, so I think we'll try and get at least two more questions that we've, we've prepared in. We did have a student um, in episode six highlighted gender as a, as a significant 
limit. And I guess the students are interested in your thoughts about how gender impacts your work and your research, not only in your own life in, as an anthropologist, but also in perhaps the people that you come into contact with uh, in, your, in the field. Uh, so what observations could you share about gender and, and anthropology? Kim, did you want to say something? Uh, sure. Um, well, there's much to be said about gender and I guess the work of anthropology. Um, the relevance of, gen of taking gender into account in the field. Uh, let me just focus on that perhaps mm -hmm. for a minute. Sure. I mean, um, in say the social impact assessment we've talked about it in the previous episode. Mm -hmm. Gender is a kind of, um, you know, a mandatory topic to address. Why? Um, just in a guest lecture in my course a few weeks ago, um, somebody who works a lot in Papua New Guinea was delivering uh, a lecture about her work in, in Papua New Guinea on social impact assessment of big resource developments, right? And, um, you know, surprisingly perhaps, for, but, but unsurprisingly to me <laughs> in a way, um, she went to villages and spoke to senior women in those villages. And the women responded saying, oh my God, you're asking me this question? You want to know my opinion? This is great. This has never happened to me because um, there is a kind of um, standard approach to just talk to the men who will say, don't talk to the women. They don't know anything. I mean, this was their response to her, to the researchers. Mm -hmm. They don't talk to the women. They have no idea what they're talking about. A really rude kind of, um, you know, proposition by the men, but common actually in many regions, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so the women, um, in fact, had lots of knowledge about um, how to um, uh, maintain gardens and grow food and you know care for families and so on and how they maintain um, village life in the absence of men when they go to the city and so on. All of that would have been unaddressed had they not mm. talked to the women properly, right? Um, so if you would go in not thinking about gender and follow the people who talk the loudest, in this case, the men, um, you'd be completely misled uh, in your findings, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a kind of basic, basic, um, you know, confirmation that gender is really important to think about before you go into the field, right? Mm -hmm. when, you, when you prepare, uh, but also when you're there. Um, in indigenous studies, it, it's of course also a classic in a way, uh, particularly in the if you like, more remote regions, but also in others where um, there is the concept uh, among certain groups of men, specific men's um, business, it's called, right, in Australia, and women's business. Um, this is largely, if you like, ceremonial, uh, ceremony related, which, you know, I can't speak to women about uh, and women can't speak to men about, right? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of... Um, yeah, uh, a bit, bit generically put, but, mm -hmm. but it's certainly relevant. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, they, these are just kind of basic um, social relations that you need to take into account when you do field work, right? Mm -hmm. And think about gender and the ways in which um, roles in human life are gendered, right? And yeah. you are as yeah. a field That's worker. That's right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So yeah. because, yeah. you know, um, where our, our bodies right. as anthropologists are involved in our field work exactly. <laughs> very much so in, in, in a way that um, that other researchers bodies are not we we take ourselves into the field mm. and we relate closely mm. with the people around us and mm. and they relate to us as humans and as humans we relate to each other as gendered beings in in, in at least part of those relations mm. and as anthropologists we understand that as persons where, where, you know, gender is cultural. So the different ways, in, in working with different societies, as, as we have, a number of us with diff different kinds of, uh, different groups of people around the world, you start to see the different way in which your gender as a field worker um, prompts different kinds of responses. So your person as a field worker in different places prompts different kinds of responses. Your person, mm. your 
personality, your being. Uh, I mean, there are people in field work always who you will like, as you do with other people in the world, who you like and you'll get on with and you'll gel with in conversation more than others. And part of that will be about gender and part of it will not, I guess. Mm -hmm. Gender is part of that story. But as one of those really key things to think about, um, I think as a as somewhat of a political anthropologist as well as an anthropologist interested in other aspects of life. To me, it's, inter it's, it's important to think about those structural aspects of equalities and inequalities in the world. And um, as a white middle-class woman working in um, indigenous societies, it's, it's white and, and middle cl and, and class, you know, relatively wealthy, coming from a relatively wealthy position in the world. And, um, and a woman. Mm -hmm. And those things matter as a field worker as well. They matter for how you elicit certain kinds of information, certain kinds of um, things that people tell you about their world and about the world, you know. So, yeah, mm -hmm. those things are important to, to be aware of as a field worker. Okay. Mm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, in, in episode five of this this course, we asked students to predict the future, actually. We asked them to <laughs> choose items from around their, their home that they think would belong in a, in a museum of the future, an anthropological, mm. an anthropological array of, of, of items. And um, our students are asking you guys, actually, to predict the future a bit. Um, our students, especially uh, Nubbin underscore Kumar, is interested in your prediction of the future of anthropology. So what will be the role of anthropologists in the next five years or maybe 10 years or 20 years if you can, if you can predict what changes or developments could occur? The discipline is, <laughs> can I start? Just yeah, really, yeah, go I'm ahead. just gonna go, I'm gonna be really brief. I, I just think that, it, that it's a really interesting question that, that, that that's being posed and, and I think anthropology is starting to talk about uh, Future, you know, there, there are a number of different um, works in anthropology that are talking about the future of design, um, uh, you know, designs for the future, rather. Um, there there have been in the last, say, few years a, a number of works that have come out thinking about hope and desire. So uh, studying the way people you know, the way people's project into the future and what that tells, that what that tells you about worldview and culture and human diversity and so on. Um, but, um, but that's not necessarily what anthropology has always done, you know. Anthropology is, is rather, it's kind of known for our focus on, um, on the history of the human and the history of human existence and, and change through time. No, a lot of focus on history. So I think that's a really interesting question that they've brought up um, about the future, and I think anthropology is starting to answer it, yeah. yeah. Or starting to think about answering it anyway. Well, I just, uh, I saw Elon Musk is saying in 20, 30 years we'll be on Mars, so perhaps anthropologists will, <laughs> will be to um, <laughs> on other planets <laughs> studying humanity and whoever else we might mm. find um, mm -hmm. elsewhere. Um, who knows? <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> uh, we've had another question, actually. So does, does feminism categorize as a field of anthropology? Is there such a thing as, as feminist anthropology? Or yes. feminism yes. within anthropology? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. There's Marxist anthropology. There's feminist anthropology. There's many kinds of anthropology that are, you know, f feminism um, is, is a political way of thought, there, there, there are, yeah, no, there's some great feminist anthropology, there's some bad feminist anthropology, <laughs> um, like, like all of these kinds, yeah. yeah. I think, just going back to that gender quickly, mm, mm -hmm. one, one, one other thing, you know, anthropology did go through a structural phase, but we've, we're, we're all about no binaries, no man, woman, it's actually, mm. there's a spectrum. Mm -hmm. So gender, like all these other mm. identities, there's always a spectrum, and, and we're trying to Mm. identify the, the, the broad ideas about what's at this end, what's at that end, what's in between. Mm. And feminist anthropology has had an incredibly, mm. um, an incredibly rich contribution to mm. that discussion. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Excellent. <laughs> there is one last question, um, and it's, 
and it's trying to end our session on a very positive note, and so we'll see if you guys are up for this challenge. Um, so student notes, we've just discussed a lot of really pressing issues over the course, and issues that do not look like they're going to be resolved in the near, near future. Can you tell us what keeps you motivated in the goal-orientated Western world? Have you seen changes to shifts in societal thinking as a result of the collective pursuit of anthropology? If so, and I hope so, the student says, can you tell us some positive outcomes? What, what positivity have you seen? <laughs> <laughs> well, well uh, I come back to, say, the applied field of social impact assessment, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if anything, the kind of work that anthropologists do can contribute to at least ameliorating, minimizing negative impacts on local populations mm -hmm. in particular projects. I mean, that's the kind of basic. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if it wasn't for social scientists um, explaining to engineers, bureaucrats, uh, who have no idea about how local communities might, op might, might relate to particular developments, then we've been a much worse place, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, that's not to say that work is always successful, um, and it's a constant battle, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I would say, you know, you, you just need to keep going, right? And, um, uh, but, and, uh, but certainly there's lots of benefit in that kind of work uh, and lots of positive outcomes in, 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 in other types of work we do as well in bringing voice to marginalized pe people who are not heard in public debates and mm -hmm. so on, and that can only be a positive thing. Uh, we don't always have control over how those kinds of insights are implemented in policy and so on and so forth, but um, at least we can, we can try, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, think, I think anthropology's greatest contribution has been to understand who we are and who other people are, and that although we're all different, we're also the same and the real deconstruction of the category of race and that we're different and that, there's, that, that, you know, that there used to be a, a pyramid of some people are better than other people. And I think anthropology's great contribution has been to, to disassemble, to deconstruct that notion that somehow some people are better than other people based on, on racial differences. We're all the same race. There are ethnic differences, religious differences, all kinds of differences. And we're all different, but we're also all the same. And I think that has an en enduring legacy of early anthropology, you know, starting 1800s, to really deconstruct a very deep-seated prejudice in, in, in most societies. And that struggle isn't over by any stretch of the imagination, but it's come a long way, and anthropo anthropology has played a, a crucial part in that. I would agree, and there are three levels to that, that anthropolo you know, anthropologists do that on a, on a kind of theoretical level um, in terms of the work that, that we write at, you know, at that kind of discursive level, at that, at that kind of elite level, if you like. Um, um, but then also, in many anthropologists also write in a public way. Um, but then in, our, in the fields that we work in, when we're relating to others, we're also relating in a way that talks to people about thinking through the sameness and difference of, of what it is to be human. I think, you know, anthropologists do work at those three levels to, to, to contribute to better thinking on human diversity, I think, yeah. Mm. Good. Well, I just want to thank all three of you for, for being here today. Thank you, Sally. Thanks, Gerhard. Thanks, Kim. It's good mm -hmm. seeing you again. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, yeah thank thanks you. for moderating. This is fun. Well, thanks, um, and then I think we'll wrap up. Thanks to all of you um, in the audience who were able to participate and those who are watching it after the fact, I guess. We hope you have a good night.